<laughs> Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the shows live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesday, Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show um, every week as we are doing today, and then is available in our show archives for you to watch later at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, <laughs> anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Um, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So we are similar to your state library. So we provide um, services and training and resources and grants and um, to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives. Um, really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, something cool libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing. Um, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on the show sometimes to do presentations for us about things we're doing here um, through the commission, but we also bring on guest speakers and that's what we have with um, today. Uh, joining us this morning is Laura Solomon. Good morning, Laura. Good morning. Hello. And she is um, with the Ohio Public Library Information Network. And she is, um, this is a session that you did, oh, is this at Computers and Libraries? I forget where. Yes, I, this was yes. at Computers and Libraries just this past spring. Yes, okay. <laughs> I always, there's so many great events and conferences out there. I can never remember where I see different things sometimes. <laughs> um, and she's gonna talk to us today about auditing our library websites, something that is, um, I think everybody should do regularly um, just to make sure you're still bringing something useful out there. So I am going to um, turn off my camera for um, the presentation, but I am still here. There we go. So your slides are full screen now. Um, and I'll let you take it away, Laura, and tell us all about how we can do this. Thanks, Krista. Hi, everyone. I'm coming to you today from uh, just south of Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I understand your weather there is probably a lot like ours, which is to say not awesome. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Two snowstorms last week and a, more snow coming tomorrow, I believe. Okay, well, you win the not fun weather award for sure. We're, we're not competing with that. Yay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Lucky you, right? <laughs> Well, that's why we're in here watching webinars, right? Yes, yes. Stay inside, stay warm, and still learn. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I've got a lot to cover in the time that we have today. So let me tell you a little bit first about uh, where I'm coming from and, and where I've been and what I do, just to give you some context for all of the things I'm about to throw at you. So the first thing is, what is an OPLIN? Uh, it does stand for Ohio Public Library Information Network. In short, uh, we are a state agency, uh, probably much in the way that the Nebraska Library Commission is, but although our scope is not nearly as large, we are specifically a tech agency. Our primary job is to provide broadband internet for all of the public libraries in Ohio. We also have some ancillary uh, tech services that we provide. We also, uh, help purchase statewide research databases in conjunction with the uh, academic and school libraries along with some LSTA money. And then, like I said, we have these sort of adjunct tech services. Uh, for example, SMS notifications for patrons. We help with internet security and, and uh, local networks that libraries have. And of course, why I'm here today, we also do web development for public library. When we say we, that is the agency, but the reality is that's mostly me. That is my job. Um, so I currently do web development and, and related work for over 100 of the 261, sorry, 251 public library systems in Ohio. So more than a third. 
uh, which is way more than we expected when we started doing this back in 2009. We expected to top out at maybe 10% of Ohio's public library systems. Uh, as you can tell, that we've way exceeded that. The demand is there. Oh, yeah. So here's here's who I am in brief. So I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I have been doing this since the days of GeoCities and before, for those of you... Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> remember GeoCities. So I'm, a, I'm, I, I'm dating myself here for sure. Um, I'm currently a World Wide Web Consortium uh, certified front end developer. And perhaps most importantly, I have built a lot of websites, folks, uh, easily 200 or more. I would say at least 150 of those are for public libraries. So um, all of that is to say that I have seen an awful lot when it comes to public library websites and just library websites in general because i have been asked also to talk about school and academic sites although that's not my focus so it's very rare these days for someone to show me a site that scares me outright um, some i might giggle about a bit but i also recognize that many libraries are not in a position to have the resources or the expertise to do development which is why the demand in ohio is so high um, because, you know, we do have some big metros like Columbus, Toledo, Cleveland, of course, um, where they either have in-house specialists uh, doing this work or they outsource it to very large development companies. Um, but for the most part, my job has been to work with small and medium-sized public libraries. And so I have definitely seen a lot of things. And one of the things that I do also as uh, again, an adjunct to what I already do at Oplin is I also provide audits. So a library, any library in Ohio uh, can ask me and say, hey, Laura, would you please take a look at our library's website and give us a written report? And so that is what I do. It's a free service that we provide to public libraries as part of our mission. So when I do an audit, uh, I actually audit a lot more than this, but we have a limited amount of time today. So I can't even share all of the categories that I look at or all of the criteria, even in the categories that I am going to cover today. So I want you to think of this as maybe the highlight reel. This is These are the things that I think you should be looking at if you're just starting out especially. Uh, and so these are the things I'm going to cover, but um, this is not, at least for me, not the most formal thing I've ever done. And I, I actually appreciate engaging directly with folks. So if you have questions, comments, experiences, please put those into the chat. Don't feel like you're interrupting me at all. Uh, I'm pretty good at interrupting myself, reading the <laughs> chat, putting myself back on track. Uh, I do it a lot. And so don't worry, you, I mean, you can ask at the end, obviously, but don't feel like you have to. Sometimes it's honestly either easier for me to derail the train while I've already <laughs> at that station. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. that's fine. And if you have commentary yeah. experiences, plunk those in as well. Yeah, type in the t questions whenever you think of something. Um, I'm watching it, we'll grab it as soon as we can. We don't want you to forget you know, and that you wanted to ask about something or comment about something later, do it when you're thinking about it and we'll keep an eye on it and we'll um, have a back and forth here, definitely conversation going. Perfect, thank you. And also if you have, I keep saying the word experiences, but I mean that because sometimes the best way to learn is from other people besides the person who's yammering at you, uh, so to speak for an hour. So if you have information that's valuable or experiences, Put that in the chat too, because it's always great to hear that from, from other people. So the very first thing I want us to be thinking about is speed. How fast does a site download? Now, I told you before that I've been doing this a long time, since the late 90s. And I can tell you back when I started and for some time after, my main problem when it came to speed was 56K modems. So if you're thinking Laura's really old, you might not be wrong. <laughs> We're so, experienced. We have I, that's right. Thank you. Yes. I am highly <laughs> experienced. I'm going to say that from, from now on. So back in the day uh, with 56K modems, which was about the best most consumers had at home, this was a huge concern. How fast does a site load? And then, of course, we got broadband internet. We got in libraries, we got T1s. 
um, at homes, we got IFDNs, we got all kinds of stuff. And eventually now most of us are running on, you know, fiber. But the thing is, is that even in some homes, that's not realistic. Not everyone has uh, still broadband internet at home or good broadband internet at home, uh, depending on where you live. And, and perhaps even most importantly, um, our home connection is not always the primary connection if we have one that we even use. So let's talk about this a little bit because speed matters a whole lot. Think about this, companies like pretty much any website you could think of that sell something, let's take Amazon because that's the mothership of selling things. These kinds of companies, when they take a look at how fast a site loads for the end user, they are working really hard. Their engineers spend a lot of time optimizing that site to shave milliseconds off of the download time. And the reason that they do this is because the longer people wait, the more likely they are to disappear and not buy something. The job of a commercial website is to get people from point A, seeing a product, to point B, actually checking out with that product as fast as possible. So speed is tremendously, tremendously important. If you think it's not important for libraries, you're gonna need to think again. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this hopefully does not surprise anyone at this point. Um, since 2015, uh, less than one, well, back in 2015, let's say, less than one third of internet traffic was mobile. It's hard to imagine that now because wow. since 2017, it's it's mm -hmm. been increased by 75%. And now if you ask a lot of people how they primarily access the internet, I assure you it's not through a desktop computer and it may not even be through a laptop, it's through mobile. For some home consumers, maybe a good number of them, I don't have that data, but for them, the primary mode of access is the phone or some kind of mobile device, which brings me back to, uh, remember how I told you I used to work with 56K modems. I always like to hold up a phone and say, this is the new 56K modem because it is not as fast as your home connection. It's pretty good depending on where you are at the moment, um, but it is, it is still not as great as really good high uh, home internet. But all of that leads to this important tidbit of information. The average time it takes to fully load the average mobile web page is somewhere between 15 to 22 seconds. Chew on that for a second. Uh, hopefully not 15 to 22 of them, but, but think about that. That's a long time in internet time. But research from Google, which of course has access to pretty much all of the internet data in the world, has found that more than 50% of people will leave a mobile page if it takes longer than three seconds to load. If your site takes more than three seconds, more than half of your audience is already gone. And it doesn't matter if you're selling something or not. And if you think libraries are not selling anything, then you need to take a real hard look at, at your mission, which is mm. to get people to use the library services. You're still selling. There, there is not uh, money involved, but you are still very much in the act of selling. So it's really important that when we look at websites that they load fast. Nobody wants to lose their audience. And if you think about your own tolerance for slow pages, uh, just because you work in a library, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be a whole lot different than the average person who isn't in a library. So when we do audits, or when I do audits, or hopefully when you're about to do audits, the, there are two tools that I generally recommend. And the first one uh, is called G metrics and G metrics typically works on kind of a grading scale of like you would see on a report card. Although as you can see here, they include the letter E in, in most American report cards, you have A, B, C, D, and then for some reason it goes straight to F. G metrics <laughs> includes the E. This is actually, you can see this, this is almost a year ago. This is CNN. CNN's load time is not terrific as you can see here, at least at this point, notice that it does point out what the test server location is. So it might have been better if I was somehow able to access a server maybe closer to home. Um, but 
if you've ever looked at CNN's website, you probably can guess why this is not very good because there's a ton going on at any given moment on CNN, not to mention all of the ads and pop-ups and it's just miserable sometimes. So this is one tool. The other tool that I suggest is this is actually from Google. And I thought this was funny because this is CNN and it, it failed <laughs> outright uh, through Google's tool, which is called um, PageSpeed uh, or some Lighthouse is the other name sometimes that you'll hear for this. But the core web vitals are essentially the same idea and you don't have to know anything about those right now, but those are the things you're typically trying to up when it comes to site speed. And you may not understand everything that you, comes back from these two tools. And by the way, I recommend you run both because you will get slightly different results and you can kind of come to a consensus about what's holding things up if you're having uh, bottleneck problems. And you may not understand everything. You may already be looking at this going, Laura, I have no clue. That's okay, that, that's okay. It's worth your time to figure it out or to get someone professional to help you out. Possible slow down. Again, we're not trying to move milliseconds off of our load time, um, at least probably not. We're, we're not Amazon, we're not eBay, et cetera, et cetera. But we still want our users to have a good experience. When it comes to knowing what things are slowing down the site, certainly those tools help. But there are generally six areas where slowdowns for libraries tend to happen. The first one, almost always is the first and most likely culprit. And that is images. By far, one of the biggest concerns I see with speed on library websites has to do with the content that's added. The biggest offenders are images. And that's because these often aren't optimized. So I'm gonna talk about how to do that uh, in a few slides. So hold on to that thought. The other thing, well, one of the other things that I see is too many HTTP or HTTPS these days requests. So that is a fancy way of saying, how many calls is this site making to another mothership to get information? If you have some kind of widget, like let's say it's pulling your most recent Facebook post, that is not data that's living locally to your site. That is data that's living at Meta, and so your site has to go get it. A lot of vendor widgets like that show book covers, same thing. They're going out to maybe EBSCO or Novelist to get that information. Anything that's going anywhere else is, is basically making a call out saying, hey, I need data, and that slows the site down. This is another one that we'll see, and that is there's no caching being done. So there, for example, there's no server that is holding a copy of the pages of this website that can be served out because if it's cached, it's not rebuilding the site or the page every time. It can just hey, say, hey, here's the version I had last time. Here you go, it hasn't changed. Um, compressing the code also. Uh, this is another thing. Some um, content management systems will do at least some of this natively, uh, but it's not a guarantee. Uh, again, anything you can squish is going to take load time off. So caching and compression are, are huge. This is another one that I'll see with content management systems. And don't think, by the way, that I'm getting down or ragging on content management systems because I'm not. Uh, we use actually Drupal as a develop. It's a development platform, really, more than a, a CMS. But we use it in, in much the same way as someone might use it as a or use a CMS, a content management system. Regardless of what you're using, if you have too many plugins added in or too many modules added in, whatever it is, those little extras that you, you plug in there to do some kind of job, which is not a bad thing. The problem is when you have a lot of them, it's almost like you're going back to that problem in yellow there, too many requests, only now they're local requests because every time that page has to load, it's now got to check with all of those plugins or modules and say, hey, you, do I need to do anything here? Are you supposed to do anything here? That's adding more time. So if you have something on your site that you are not using anymore, take it off, uninstall it, you will probably shave at least a couple things there. 
Another problem is the server. The kind of server that your site is hosted on really does matter. And I don't mean which company makes the server, but what that server is also hosting. Now, if you're even if it's inside your library, if you have your own local server, um, first of all, you've got to maintain that, which isn't fun for anybody as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but more importantly, if that server is sharing its resources with other things, they may be sucking bandwidth that you aren't even aware of. This is one of the reasons that there's a pricing difference for a lot of uh, hosting companies. If you look at pricing, typically there's a, a quote unquote regular or hosted uh, or shared version, which is basically, it's like you living in an apartment building, you're sharing you know, the water, the hot water with everybody else um, and that's cheaper. Or there's a dedicated server where you're not sharing anything and you've got all the stuff. It's all yours, all the things. Um, that's way more expensive, but it's also way more efficient for, for your site if you're the one who has the dedicated resources. Lastly, there's something called um, render blocking. And you'll probably see this if you start running uh, different kinds of checks on your site for speed. And that is basically a fancy way of saying there's something in the way that is taking too long to load. And so the rest of the site isn't loading. So for example, again, going back to that yellow square up there, it could be making a request to somewhere else. And it, so it's held up and it's not loading anything uh, below that in the page, or maybe uh, there's some JavaScript there that's taking too long. So these are, that's why all these parts and pieces have to be optimized, because otherwise you end up with these bottlenecks, and sometimes they're interconnected bottlenecks. Another thing to consider, especially because we now know that mobile is extremely important, mm -hmm. um, we have to also test separately uh, for mobile devices and, and not even necessarily the speed, but also how mobile friendly a site is. Now, back in the day when mobile became a thing, I wanna say around 2011 to 2013 maybe, um, I used to build separate mobile friendly sites. There, remember way back, it was either, there might be a link on a site to say, see the mobile version, that's long gone, but you still need to test your site to see if it is in fact mobile friendly and Google conveniently enough, our overlord, and I say that only half jokingly, <laughs> um, provides a tool to do this because it actually, when it comes to page ranking, Google prefers mobile and it prefers effective mobile. So this is another tool that you can use. In addition, again, this is not specifically for speed, but it's, it's an adjunct, perhaps I use that word a lot today, um, you can see here, I ran, this was a local library here in Ohio. Uh, you can see here, it, it got through the site just fine. It crawled it successfully, uh, but it did find a couple problems where the clickable elements are too close together. Remember, people have to use their finger and not everybody has the same size finger. And text is too small, which is a common problem uh, on websites that aren't really designed well for mobile. There we go. Okay, so let's move on to images, which I mentioned before are a significant problem, especially when it comes to speed, but they also present other problems. Uh, so let's talk about why that is and what some of those problems might be. So when I'm doing an audit, for a library, yes, obviously I'm testing for speed. And like I said before, a lot of the problems with speed can often be traced to images that haven't been optimized. And I promise in a couple slides, I'm gonna to get to that. Um, but there are images, they just, they just took the raw version of it and slapped it up there and, and hoped it was all okay and chances are good, it's not. Um, but there's some other reasons to be really careful about how you use images on your library's website. There's three of them that I encourage you to consider before you put up any image onto your site. The first one is money, the second one is attention, and the third one is purpose. So let me break this down a little bit. When I talk about money, I am not talking about how much that image might have cost. Let's say you license it from Shutterstock or Dreamtime. That's not what I mean here. Yeah, there's a cost to that. Usually it's not huge, but that's not what I'm talking about because we're talking about the 
user experience here? What is the end user, not you, gonna gonna have as a, as a, a way? What are they gonna experience? I'm just fumbling that completely now. What is the end user going to experience? And images play into that a lot. I think there is a tendency for libraries to throw up images because they think they look cool. Um, one of the things that I have heard forever in libraries is we need an image to jazz XYZ up, jazz it up with a picture. This is a problem for all kinds of reasons, but this is just the first one. Remember how I said, that lots of people are on mobile, right? Probably like 75% or more, it's certainly a majority. When you're on mobile, not everyone has an unlimited data plan. And even if they have an unlimited data plan, rarely does unlimited these days actually mean unlimited. You will typically get throttled uh, at some point if you're downloading too much. So especially if someone has a, an un, uh, a limited data plan, that means that every time they download an image on their mobile device, it's costing part of that plan to do it. Anytime you look at a picture, you should be asking yourself, if I had to pay by the, the megabyte or the gigabyte or whatever, um, or the kilobyte even, would I want to? Would I literally pay for this to download it? If the answer is no, ditch it absolutely ditch it because if it if you remember if it's going to literally cost someone money it darn well better be worth it i've been mentioning this a couple times so let me explain this now and that is compression so this is just one tool to do that this is just one of my favorites um, and by the way if you use something like photoshop or gimp or paintshop pro which are very robust graphic programs they have something like this already built in don't feel like you need to go get another tool. But for those of us who are not using that kind of software or need another option, this is terrific. So what you're looking at here is a screenshot from a um, tool called compressor.io. And you can see here, if you look at the big picture to the right, there's a picture of the iguana. And you can see on the side that says original, this iguana picture started out at 700 kilobytes. But then after it was compressed, it was only 250 kilobytes. According to their math, that's a 64% file size compression. So it's mm -hmm. going to download much faster because it's been compressed. The neat thing about image compression is that you can almost never tell that it's happened. As I was say, it doesn't look like I, I see, it's supposed to see like what the difference is. I can't tell. <laughs> that's ex And that's the point. Now, if you that's, compress uh -huh. it down to, you know, 99% file compression, you you well, bet you're going to see a there's difference. There's limits, yes, yes. <laughs> but, the, but the fact that you can squish this down so much is amazing. And actually, one of the neat things about these kinds of tools when in, and just compressing in general is sometimes you'll actually make the photo look better because what's happening is with compression is there it's taking out pixels the human eye can't see. It's like, hey, you don't need this one. You don't see it anyway. So you actually get some more clarity oftentimes in the compressed version than you will have in the original version. So if you are not already compressing your images, optimizing your images, this is the your first go-to when it comes honestly to uh, slowdowns. This is where you should be starting, especially because a lot of libraries have really big images like in their, their carousels that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, very, very important step. Secondly, images cost the user attention, not just potentially money, because it takes time, even if it's milliseconds, for someone to see an image and absorb what that image means what the context is. And we and our users have limited attention that we can give to something. When you use an image just to add visual interest, you know, when you jazz it up with a picture, you're likely taking time away from something else. It's important to remember that our users are task driven. This is perhaps one of the most significant changes that I have seen since the, the very early days of the graphic internet. 
because back then people browsed the internet. Remember that? You might have browsed the internet. Nobody browses the internet anymore. You might scroll endlessly through Instagram, but I guarantee <laughs> you, you, you are not browsing the internet anymore. There's just too much out there. Everybody is task driven. That means people come to our websites because they want to do something, find something, or see something. That means if you have an image that is not helping them to accomplish whatever that task is, it's just an obstacle. It's useless to them. Again, is it worth somebody's attention? Is it worth somebody's money? If you can't definitively say yes to both of those, ditch it. And that leads to this. What is the purpose of this image? Too many things are just useless. We think that it looks pretty. And there, there are some use cases, I think, where looks pretty can be argued for. I'm not saying uh, that every library should have a, a brutalist design site. For those of you who are not familiar with brutalism, it's basically, think GeoCities without anything beeping or... <laughs> <laughs> flashing or or anything i mean it's just bare bones website just just the text almost um i'm not arguing for that i think there's a lot of problems with that too but you do have to remember that all of these images do have to have a reason for existing on your site they have to serve a purpose not just for you but for the end user along those lines clip art i you know i honestly thought that by this point in my life in 2024 that I would not be talking about clip art on library websites. Sadly, here we are, it's January 2024, and I'm still talking about it. So these are meaningless. Uh, and you might be thinking, but Laura, we don't have any clip art on our website. And I would say, good job, you, you get a cigar, good job for you. Um, I'm very happy about that. You're not making me drink or cry. That's always a bonus. But there are too many websites for libraries that I have seen, even recently, I will not name any, um, where they're using clip art. And I understand that clip art is easy, it's free, um, it's not hard to get, it doesn't cost anything, like maybe some stock images might potentially have a cost. Um, but remember, first of all, mobile users may literally be paying for that clip art. It doesn't have a purpose. Probably the most impactful thing that I can tell you about clip art is this, and I've been saying this for years. Do you want your institution represented by the same artwork that my son was using to jazz up his book reports in the third grade? If the, the answer should be no, spoiler alert, no, you do not. So it's time to put away the clip art, and I know this is hard, but if, and if that means the difference between having an image and not having an image, that's okay. You don't have to have an image. Remember, people are task driven. You do not have to have pictures just to have pictures. Okay. Carousels. Let's talk about these. If you didn't know what a carousel is, I guarantee you, you've seen them. They're exactly what you're looking at here. It's a big rotating banner, usually on the home page. And I, like it says there on the screen, I'm about to get up on a big soapbox, so get ready. And I, I'm going to apologize in advance. My <laughs> job here today is to convince you to never, ever use these again. And here's why. And by the way, um, there's a, a user experience drinking game for those of us involved in web work. And uh, this is one of... <laughs> One of the, the options there, if someone says carousel drink, and, and you know, so I joke about drinking, I actually don't, but I sure understand the impetus to want to, uh, and this is one of the reasons why. So first of all, from an accessibility stance, which is something I actually do evaluate as well, um, but I can't talk about today, carousels are they're, they're awful. I don't know any a good way, a nice way to say that. When it comes to an accessibility viewpoint, these things are just terrible for people with disabilities. It's very hard to make them accessible. And I work very hard to make them as accessible as I can because I still have to build them because I can't necessarily convince every library I talk to not to have them. Um, it always amazes me that in a profession that uh, professes to be about information, libraries are really good about ignoring it when it comes to carousels because they see them and they think they're really cool and they're not. And so one of the things that I share with them to hopefully convince them out of it is the data about how nobody 
wants these. Nobody, 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 nobody. Um, only 1% of people actually click on a website slider and because many confuse them for ads. You and I know they're not ads, although kind of technically they are because they're promoting things for your library. So people bypass them like, eh, whatever, it's a big ad. Of the 1% of people who do click, 89% of those click on only the first banner they see and that's it. So they're not sticking around to see the other ones. So the user uh, ROI on this is absolutely miserable and that alone should be a reason for, to get them off your, your website. Um, I have kept this around for a really long time because it is so, so true. I understand that carousels are a political football in libraries uh, because especially admins, I'm gonna blame the admins, but it's not always admins. Um, we'll say, well, you know, this solves a bunch of political problems because we can, you know, you want this on the homepage and you want this on the homepage and there's not room for all this, ta-da, carousels, because we can put all of that stuff in one space and it will just move it around. Well, we already know why this is a bad idea. So, um, but if you can't avoid them, which is, you know, the story of my life, um, cause I am forced to keep building them. There's a few rules that you should use first, uh, there should be five or fewer, and this is not my saying that. This is Nielsen Norman Group, which is the largest think tank on the net. They've been doing studies on user behavior for decades now. They're pretty much the gold standard when it comes to studies about how people use the web. Um, they have said, if you can't get rid of a carousel, five or fewer, which makes total sense because if you have more than that, uh, people aren't sticking around to see it anyway, right? They only click on the first one if they click at all because only 1% even click. Optimize those images, already talked about that. These are especially big, so you generally need to optimize them. Lastly, and this is a hard sell, I'll tell you, because the main reason that I have found that libraries want these to begin with is because they look quote unquote cool because they rotate, they're animated, which is funny because that's actually one of the main reasons people ignore them is because they rotate, because they look like ads. We have been trained as a society from very early on in the days of the internet to think that anything that moves is an ad and mm -hmm. it's not any different <laughs> for, for carousel. So if you can possibly avoid rotating them, absolutely do so. That's, I know, this is all a hard sell, but I'm telling you, um, please, please and remove They're these. so popular and they're like everywhere on you know, the pages, the, the sites that you think are the most, you know, the best and the most popular and the well, most well used sites, not even just library sites, they're just so many places. They are. And but the nice thing is they're kind of on the downtrend. That makes me very happy. I'm hoping they die out entirely by the time that I retire. I don't know that that will happen, but I'm going to do my part to get them off of library sites, if nothing else. <laughs> Okay, so navigation. This is this is one we could spend a lot of time on, but again, highlight reel. So I'm going to give you the important things for you to be thinking about. When I started back in the day, boy, I feel like at this point I should just get out my walker and tell people to get the hell off my lawn. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but but I, I truly I start to feel like that when I say back in the day and back when I was doing these things. So back in the time that I started doing this work, there was actually recommendations about how many options should be in your main nav. And for a long time, I followed those not understanding or maybe not knowing like a lot of people that there wasn't actually data behind that. The, the main recommendation that we would typically use was five to seven. It turns out there actually is not any real magical number that was all made up. But here's the thing, while you might think that gives you free license to be, oh, we can add whatever we like and however many options we like to our main, main navigation, that's not really true. Because you have to be very wary here of something called cognitive overload, which is just a fancy UX term for you're making people think too much and the more people have to think, the more likely they are to not bother with you at all. So you are gambling every time that you add an option. Mm -hmm. That means that even though you might theoretically have the ability to put as many things as you want into the main navigation, you do have to look at your use case and maybe skim that down as much as you can. 
which seems almost counterintuitive because if you look at things like eBay and Amazon, you know, they've got tons of things, but they're also a very different entity than, a, than any kind of library. And they're, they operate in a very different way. So this is, it used to be that people in libraries would say, well, Amazon does it, we should do this. That is really not the case. That's apples and oranges, truly. Uh, so be very careful about how many things. Take a look at your nav and say, is there anything that we could get rid of or subsume to something else as a child page of something else? You know, do, do, does this thing, you know, history of the library really need to be at the top level of our navigation? The answer is almost certainly no. See what you can do to reorganize your nav so it is, is more, uh, is skimmed down, trimmed down. Here is something, this term mystery meat, you've probably heard it before in relation to maybe your school cafeteria where you didn't know what it was you were eating. And that is where this term or phrase originated, but it actually uh, came into widespread use in the web industry in the late 90s. An author, uh, called, his name was Vince Flanders. He, he stopped doing things around almost a decade ago, but he wrote a couple of books. He actually used this term to apply to things on a website where you would click it and not know what it is, just like you would eat that meat in the cafeteria and not know what it is. People don't like mystery meat navigation. All of the examples I'm showing here, like links and resources, info or information, these don't mean anything. People want to know what they're going to get before they click, just like you want to know what kind of meat you're going to be eating before you actually bite into it. Um, if you have something along these lines in your navigation, you need to rework this and you need to think very hard about what it is you're actually offering people. Breadcrumb trails. Here's an example here. Uh, this does originate with the whole idea of Hansel and Gretel and having a trail of breadcrumbs to help you find your way home. That's exactly what this is. And it is very much uh, in use in websites and hopefully it is in yours. This is a really important navigational piece uh, that you should be aware of. People will go as far as they need to into a website, as deep down the rabbit hole as they need to go, if they know where they are, because breadcrumbs provide context about where a user is and where they are in, in the whole structure of your website and allows them to access other parts of that uh, structure directly. Like you can see here, each one of these is probably a link, staff directory about us, or at least about us and home. So they can click on those directly. They're not scared to be in the rabbit hole because there's signs telling them how to get out of it or to get to other parts of the site. There are three other things about navigation that I would like you to think about when you're doing your audit. And the first one is location. And I don't mean the location of your library, the location of your site. I'm talking about location of elements within your site. Sometimes libraries think that they can be very creative and put things in non-standard places. I hate to tell you this, but there are actually pretty strict rules from a behavioral standpoint about where certain things belong on a website. For example, logo. Always a logo top left, always, always, always. Unless you are an artist or photographer with a very artsy, unique site, and that, that matches, you know, that tracks for that profession, your logo should always be in the top left. Search should always be in the header. There, there aren't exceptions to these that work well or work at all. That These are just things that they go where they go. And, and I'll, that's all I'll say about that. Redundancy, this is something that dates back away also, but I know it still exists. I literally saw it two days ago on a library website. So what I mean by redundancy is when you have a link in the main navigation at any level. So if you have drop downs, it could be anywhere in the navigation. And then that link is repeated elsewhere on the site. Typically I would see this where let's say there's a link to history of the library up in the main nav somewhere, maybe under about us. And then that same link, it could even be just about us, is down in the footer. Some of those links get, or even all of those links get repeated in the footer. This is bad for all kinds of reasons. First of all, well, really all of all, it's bad from a usability perspective and it's bad for an accessibility people with a disability perspective. Because people, regardless of how they're using the web with assistive tech or not, don't understand why the link is in two places 
it's it's an outdated convention and why are why is it there we people can see it in both places this dates back to when people allegedly did not want to scroll on a website and so you would put things in two places because chances are they wouldn't see the other place you and i we all know that people scroll if you, people didn't scroll, nobody would use Instagram, okay? People who <laughs> scroll, and yes, on desktops, for the few that are looking at desktops, we are used to scrolling. It's a normal behavior. The last thing I'll say here about navigation, this is another thing that spread by word of mouth for decades, and there was no data behind it. This has been debunked repeatedly, and that is the three-click rule. And if you have heard the three-click rule, um, you hopefully you have, but if you haven't, the three-click rule basically states that people will not go further into a website more than three clicks from the homepage, which is complete baloney. It's been since the day this somehow was generated. And especially because people don't always end up on a website when they come from say Google on the homepage. So how do you know you're three clicks away? Nobody, nobody does this, nobody cares. It's never been accurate. Um, so stop saying it. There we go. That's enough about that. Too, the location and the three click. This is things that we have like studies that prove all of this too, of where things need to be, where people look on a page, how people click through. This isn't just like, you know, so I want people to know that, you know, this is based on, you know, actual research that's been done. <laughs> Absolutely. Nielsen Norman Group is really anyone's best friend who's who's wondering about how people use things or don't use things. Um, you know, that's <laughs> I spend a lot of time looking at that stuff and uh, they actually have they will email your 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 that yeah, their newest findings to you also. So I heartily recommend that as a resource. OK, let's talk about search. This is our last thing today. Uh, search is really, really important. Uh, if you don't have search on your library's website, this is something that should have been fixed last week, last year, last decade. This is this is really, really important because search is often people's first resort and last resort. Some people will dig through your nav, a lot of people won't. So even if you have a really, really well-designed and organized main navigation, people often will skip it and go straight to the site search. Also with libraries, one of the main things that happens, and maybe folks here can attest to this, is that people will also think that the search searches the catalog, which makes sense. Um, that it's like, oh, there's a search box, it's a library, let me see if I can find my book. So this leads to other issues that libraries have to contend with in, as far as search. So some libraries, what they will do in trying to address this, let me show you these two different things. If you look to the bottom right, you'll see here, this was an example I pulled from a library trying to address this problem where they have a, a search specifically, for, essentially for the catalog and another one for the website. In theory, this kind of makes sense, except that this is, this is actually a big no-no because this increases that cognitive load. As soon as you start making people think about which option best fits their use case, you've lost them. Some people will go this far and be like, oh, website. Um, there's a lot of text here for search also. A aside from that, we don't wanna give them more than one thing. Up on the upper left is an example. Uh, it's one of our older sites at this point, but it demonstrates a good way to deal this, deal with this. And you can see here that there's a drop down. This is not particularly complex. Um, where they can search for different things and it's all in one box. And you can also see, by the way, we don't use the word catalog in this search feature. It will often get put in the main navigation, uh, but believe it or not, we don't use it in search whenever we can avoid it because data also says that library users don't always understand the word catalog, which seems that blows my mind, probably yours too, but there's data to back that up. Um, library jargon that we use that's that's such that's an uh, uh, it's been an issue forever yep and exactly for some reason we just can't get out of it i think i don't know why we keep talking about it but people still keep using it right that's exactly right um interlibrary loan or ils is is of course another one nobody knows what that is um there's all kinds of examples i'm sure that we could think of 
but we try to avoid the word catalog at least in search. We still generally will include it in the main nav when we work with the library. It's very hard to get away with uh, not having it there. Uh, research databases, by the way, there's a huge one. We've all been struggling with that jargon for ages and uh, there's no good replacement that I know of. I've talked to librarians from all across the US and nobody seems to have a good replacement for this that, lot, that patrons really understand. This is a more recent one um, that Nielsen Norman found, uh, I, it's less than 10 years ago. It was, for us at least, it was a fairly new bit of research. And as soon as we became aware of it, we immediately started removing this from our sites. We had been using placeholders uh, in all of our sites for some time because we thought they were helpful. So what is a placeholder? You can see it here circled in the red. The idea is that it's some kind of text that is in your search field already with the intent that somebody will click there and typically that search text will go away and they can start typing their search. What Nielsen Norman Group found is that this is actually more harmful than helpful, uh, which was a big surprise to us. Uh, so we have started taking, not started, we have a long time ago, taking this out uh, and just leaving a blank search field. So if you have a placeholder, this is hopefully an easy fix that you can do while you're doing your audit is to get rid of this because people don't understand necessarily that they're supposed to click in there or what they're supposed to do when it has text already in it. I mentioned before that search has to be in the header at least at the, above the fold, which is an expression that actually comes from the print world. But when we look at, say, a desktop or a laptop scenario, it means without having to scroll. Um, so that's above the fold when we start talking about digital. But at the very least, it has to be at, near the top of a site. To tell you a little anecdote, several years ago, we had a library come to us that wanted a new website. Uh, they were a new client. And they were insisting that they wanted search in the footer. They did not want it anywhere near the top of the page. And after some discussion within our agency, we declined to take them as clients. Um, we decided that we didn't want our name associated with that. Uh, just because your library doesn't mean that we're going to do that. We don't want people to think that's how we handle websites. Um, and could we also, by the way, don't make a profit because we're a state agency. So we're not required to take on libraries as clients. Fortunately, uh, that was enough to make them rethink their position and they decided that they would live with it being where it was actually supposed to be. So the search is supposed to be up top. Remember, first and last resort. So people need to know that it's available. A neat tool that you can use as part of your audit is, again, Google, right? Google's everything pretty much, it seems like. But Google has a neat little tool that will tell you what people are searching for when they look for you specifically. So this is Germantown Public Library, a small library here in Ohio. And I threw this into their, their interface just to see what came back. And you can see the vast majority of the options that people were inputting to Google to find this library, you know, Germantown Public Library, Germantown Library, so forth. But the two most interesting pieces here for me, even though they didn't get many clicks, but this still lists them in, in descending order, is you can see down at the bottom, Germantown Library Hours and Germantown Library Jobs. They don't have a ton of clicks, but this is also a teeny little library. So <laughs> I'm not expecting them to have a ton of hits for those pages. So what does that say? If you're doing an audit, it means, well, maybe we need to be prioritizing the things that people are actually looking for. Something to consider. Yeah. This is a, a neat way to really focus on how people are using your site. Hmm. Another thing uh, that you can find through Google Search Console, which is a related tool, has to do uh, with knowing whether or not you have a site map. Now, when I talk about a site map, I'm talking about one that is created with XML, not something where you basically said, here is the top level page about us and under about us is history of the library and services and all these things. A human made sitemap is not the same. One that can be read 
by a human normally is not the same as what Google actually wants. And the reason that Google wants this is because it's a structured representation of your site's content and it can index it better. You get a more thorough indexing by the Google overlords if you have an XML sitemap. So this is something that you should consider adding. Um, if you're using a content management system, it almost certainly has an option for that or something you can add in that will do that. So this, this will definitely help your stuff get found better. So to sum up, and then I'll take questions because uh, I'm sure hopefully there are some, but mm -hmm. the big things to remember today after everything I've just yacked about, um, remember that there are actual rules. And I try to emphasize this every time I talk about web design to libraries in any way, because so much of the early web, um, people are still holding on to, and it's, it's almost always anecdotal. Just like when somebody says to me, well, Mr. Smith told us at the reference desk that he didn't like where this button is. That is not data. One of my favorite sayings is anecdotes are not data. Um, so your anecdote doesn't compare to the actual studies that have been done on behavior uh, by users. Uh, so remember that there are rules, just like certain I told you today about where um, your logo should go, where that search should go. You shouldn't have placeholders. These are all based on data. These are not things that I made up just because I feel like being mean today. This is another thing. Your website is not a special snowflake. I know, because I also have a library degree, that libraries are taught to consider their communities when they do collection development, which is absolutely right, and you should continue doing that. The problem is that that philosophy does not apply to websites, because websites have a user interface. If your site operates way differently than, say, anything else <laughs> online, and people have to learn how to use your website, some of you may be old enough to remember, we used to have to teach people how to use library websites. They were actual programs on event calendar, how to use the library website. You never ever wanna be in a position to be doing that anymore. Your, your site should not be a special snowflake. So when you're doing audits, remember that. You don't just bypass something like, oh, well, our, our patrons want this. No, they don't. No, they don't. That's anecdotes. People have, normalized standard behaviors and they need to be accommodated when you're working with your website or working on your website. So that's a lot. <laughs> and that's only part of what I do in an audit, but the things I think if you're going to get started with auditing that you should probably focus on the most. So I'm happy to take comments, questions, tomatoes, do you want to throw at me, uh, whatever you got. Snowballs as, as this is season. <laughs> That's right. Well, I've got my own snowball, so <laughs> I'll pass those on. Thanks. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? Um, type into the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, it is um, a little after 11 o'clock, but that's okay. We will um, stay on here as long as anyone has any questions. Get all your questions answered before we do wrap things up. So, so if there's anything um, you want to know more about, anything you were um, confused about, want more clarification, um, if you have anything you want to share about what your libraries have done as far as doing an audit of them or uh, struggling with anything on your website, type into the question section. Um, we didn't um, get any questions as you were talking, but that's okay. People are just very... Um... Ah, okay, Ooh. so we do have one question. Okay, we okay. Some... Wait, okay, here we go. Now, of course, things come in. Thank you uh, for a fun and educational presentation. Great. Um, oh, and someone says, appreciate all the resources you shared as well. Um, yes, something I'll mention, the slides will also be available along with the recording later too. So um, you'll have all of this information and any of the links that are on here um, will be available to you um, as well. Um, the question we have, and I think it will be specific to where you are, Ohio. Um, someone wants to know, what is your availability and cost for consultation? Now you work for a state, your state agency of, of in Ohio, so I'm assuming this is just something that you actually do for Ohio libraries, not outside of the state. That is correct. Um, so the services that I offer are basically for Ohio public libraries. That's the mm -hmm. scope of our agency. Um, right. I will tell you, and I don't. If this is promotional, tell me to shut up, and I will stop. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I, I have been asked to do um, audits of libraries that are outside of Ohio. If that's the case, um, then maybe hit me up via email and I can direct you uh, to how that works. But it's, it's not something that I mean to put out there as like something I'm looking to do all the time. Right. Right. So, so, so Laura's here just tells like this is something you can do, not necessarily selling her services. <laughs> um, because, you know, as you said, you work for you're an Ohio state agency. So, yeah, but we could have places people you could talk to. Um, someone wants to know the sites you mentioned to use for the audit. Are they easy to use those sites? I am not IT. And this is something we have here. And you mentioned too, that you do this mainly for the small and medium sized libraries. And that is a big thing we have here in Nebraska. Yeah, so many, most of our libraries all are small, uh, one person, only a couple of people um, running them. So they do need something that they can easily jump into. That's a fair question. So I think most of the tools that I showed today are pretty easy with the exception of uh, Google's PageSpeed Insights or Lighthouse and, um, GT metrics, those will give you, both of them will give you tons and tons of information. The problem is interpreting that information. And I understand that. So at the very least, you might want to put your site through those tools to give you some idea of how you're doing. If you don't have the resources to fix it, at the very least, you might want to be thinking about some of the other things that I mentioned, even if you can't interpret the reports, you know, are you optimizing your images or do you have plugins uh, that you're not using anymore? Um, those are fairly easy fixes for the most part and may take yeah. some time off your speed. Yeah, there's some easy quick things you can do. Yeah. Um, we do have a question about something that we have here in Nebraska, and I am actually going to um, I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen because I did want to show I was I planned on talking about this. So uh, thanks to Deb for that question. Um, um, and someone says, great information. Thank you so much. A lot to think about. Yes. Uh, the questions. And of course, as you see here, there's a carousel running on this page. <laughs> uh, let's just not talk about that. Anyway, here in Nebraska, for Nebraska libraries, we do have our Nebraska libraries on the web project where we host WordPress sites for, um, it says over hundreds, 114 libraries in Nebraska. Um, we don't have library systems in Nebraska, but we, each library is its own individual entity. Um, we have about 270 something public libraries in the state and 114 of them, we are hosting their websites um, through WordPress, through this project that's been around for I don't even know how long, a long time. Uh, and the question is, what are your thoughts on our shared WordPress server? Because this is something where we host them on a shared server here um, to the Library Commission. Now we have staff that are in charge of this here. So, um, and then the libraries just have their sites that, so we do the, uh, the back end of all of this. Um, so they want to know, like, what do you, I guess, what is your thoughts on what we are doing here in Nebraska? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I haven't looked at the service at all. Um, I think yeah. the fact that you're providing ready-made sites, that's always a good thing. Um, it, as far as the shared server concept, that really depends. You know, if you have a lot of small sites, then it may not be an issue. And, and if it is, that's something you need to talk to your IT folks about is, you know, maybe splitting that up or um, using a caching server or something that's going to fix that if it's a problem. There's nothing inherently wrong with a shared server. It can be an issue um, if you're sharing the server with a resource hog. So for example, and this isn't happening, but let's say that, you know, Toledo is sharing a server with Germantown and Germantown is that tiny little library I was showing you the the search options for, um, that could be a problem. Um, you know, Toledo is far, far bigger and I'm sure gets way more traffic than Germantown ever would. I can tell you for an organization that I do the website for, it's a tiny little organization. It's on a shared commercial server and I have no way of knowing what else is on that server, but I can tell you the organization site is pitifully slow. There's nothing I can do about it because it's on this server and again, nothing else I can do about it. So we're stuck with it. If you don't have to be stuck with it, don't be. That's all I can say. But it might be perfectly fine there in Nebraska. 
Yeah, and this is something, it is, yeah, as you said, it's not the big libraries that are coming to us. They've got Omaha, Lincoln, um, the big seats. They, they've got their own thing going, and it's great. This is the littlest ones, and um, we have multiple surfers that we have for various things here through the Library Commission. So, I mean, we're the state agency running and hosting this here, um, and, and our um, staff are, uh, I don't believe we've ever had any issues with that, because, yeah, there's no... I've never heard of any particular library overwhelming the system. Um, we also have, we do have an element regional library systems. Here's our Central Plains library system. They are not library systems in this, in this, in the like in other states where libraries become members of them. They are more an outreach from the commission, a regional person. Um, I, I was talking about like a boots on the ground where um, to do training and um, consultation, helping libraries do their job. They don't become members of it. It's just like another arm of us here at the Library Commission. Um, but they have their websites through um, this Nebraska Libraries on the Web Project too. Um, cool. This is just one of them, our central plains for the, the middle of the state of Nebraska. Um, and we're always getting new libraries added to it. Um, um, uh, and I should mention, it's so interesting that we're doing this, se this session here today. And um, I'm going to go to our Encompass Live website now and show you. Oops. Encompass Live. If you use Encompass Live in your search engine of choice, whatever you like to use, um, it will always come up with us, our main page and our archive page. Um, so far, we're the only thing called that on the internet, as far as I can tell. So nobody else is allowed to use that name. But um, if you go to our main page here, you will see actually in two weeks, we are doing a WordPress website refresh session, session <laughs> um, which um, will probably be something very similar to here, talking about auditing, looking at um, you know different ways to prevent con present content, um, how to update things on your WordPress sites that either you have yourself or that we host for you. Um, so I think this would be a nice kind of companion session to um, today's doing the audit. Cool. Yeah. Um, so this is our um, pretty sweet tech. Amanda Sweet is our technology innovation librarian. She's in charge of our Nebraska libraries on the web project. Um, and once a month, she comes on Encompass Live. It's always the last Wednesday of the month to do something techie related. Um, it's uh, we have techie related things other times during the during the month sometimes, but always the last Wednesday of the month is her session. And for January, this is what she is doing: a WordPress website refresh session. You can see her next one will be February twenty eighth. Yeah. All right, does anybody have any other questions? I don't see any new ones coming in while we were just chatting here. Uh, but if anyone has anything desperate you want to ask of Laura, uh, type into the question section. Um, while I'm waiting to see if anything comes up, I will um, show you here. Uh, so this is our main page with our uh, upcoming shows, but our archives are right here. There's a link at the bottom right underneath them for our, our show archives. Most recent ones at the top of the page. Uh, today's show will be up there by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, WordPress, not WordPress, as long as go to webinar and YouTube cooperate with me, there'll be a link here. Um, there'll be a link to um, Laura's slides. You can send them to me whenever you get a chance, Laura. Okay, will do. And um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is available. We also post that on our social media. We do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We post reminders. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. Um, here's the notification of the recording of last week's um, show. So we will post um, out here when um, the recording is available. Uh, we also post onto our Twitter account and Instagram. Uh, we use Encump Live, a little abbreviation hashtag for the show. So we'll get announced out there and then also push out onto our uh, Nebraska Library Commission mailing lists when the recording is available. There we go. Uh, while we're here on the recording page, I'll show you there is a search feature. If you want to see if we've done a show on any particular topic that you might be interested in, you can search our show archives. You can search all of our show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something very current. Um, that is because this is all of our show archives. And I'm not going to scroll all the way down, but as you can see, this is a very long page. If you can see the little search, the scroll bar. Speaking of scrolling, <laughs> as you were <laughs> earlier, Laura. Um, this goes back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in January 2009. Wow. So, yeah, this January 2024 is the beginning of our 16th year of the show. 
which it blows my mind every time I say that. <laughs> but um, but we have all of our show archives here. We have them all on our YouTube. Um, so just uh, pay attention when you are watching an old show to the original broadcast date. They all have a date, so you know when it first um, um, happened. Uh, some of the shows will be great, um, good, um, stand the test of time, be good, still useful, but some things will become old and outdated. Um, resources and services may have changed drastically or no longer exist anymore. People may work at completely different libraries than when, or organizations than when they presented to us with us like 10 years ago. Um, links may be broken. We don't have a lot of staff here to go back and double check links necessarily, so you might find some things broken out there. Let me know if there is. We can always fix things on the fly, but just pay attention to those broadcast dates. Um, but you know, this is something libraries do. We keep things for historical purposes, and as long as we have somewhere to host all of our archive, which right now is on YouTube, uh, we will always have the full um, archive out there for everybody. All right, so I didn't see any other good, any questions coming in. So I think we will wrap it up for today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you so much, Laura, for being here today. This is really um, great, useful information. As you said, yes, there's a lot. <laughs> um, You're very welcome. I hope that people find it useful and they can at least use it to get started with an audit. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but do reach out to her if you have any other questions um and uh sign up for our upcoming shows next week our show i, I mentioned a week in two weeks is the pretty sweet tech but next week's show up next week is our best new teen reads of 2023 um this is sally snyder our coordinator of children and young adult library services here at the library commission her annual wrap-up of um, new um books for middle and high school levels that she read in 2023 that she thought might be of interest to you i know people look forward to these um, this is her Teen Reads one, and if you look at our archives, she did her um, Best of Children's book back, books list back in November, so that's her companion show. The recording's already out there. Um, and then she also has her summer reading one that she did um, in December. Those are her three end-of-the-year sessions that she always does um, uh, with book lists that you can use um, for children's books, next year's summer reading, and now uh, Teen. So please do sign up for that show and any of our other upcoming shows. There's all of our February ones already on the calendar. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Laura, and hope we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>